I much prefer to come before you and speak about joy and speak about happiness. But the world is full of laments. Our lives are often stricken with grief. And so we read today from the Holy Scriptures, from the book of Psalm, and we read Psalm 137 that we have heard sung for us today beautifully by our choir in their call to worship and sung just now from the faith we sing. As Melanie told the children, it is a psalm that remembers a time when the children of Israel were captive in Babylon. Hear now these words. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willow trees, there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem's fall. How they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O oh, daughter Babylon, you destroyer, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I read those words and I feel the anger and the frustration of the Hebrew children as they want revenge against the people who have destroyed their beloved home, Jerusalem, and taken them away from their land and then mock them by saying, sing to us your songs. I hear their pain and their anger. And then I gather together with my sweet little grandson, Joey, two years old and full of life and joy every single day. And I teach him to pray, God is great, God is good. And I teach him to sing, He's got the whole world in his hands. And then I realize how simplistic and how easily that beautiful faith meets with the reality of tragedies in our world. So I confess to you today that even though I have a seminary degree and I have been serving in churches for more years than you want to know, <laughs> I don't have an answer to this most perplexing question before us. I realize that our lives are often blown apart by natural disasters and our hearts cry out with pain and anguish. I think about the people in Ukraine and how we seek to reach out to them with humanitarian efforts. I think about the people in Israel and Palestine and all that is going on tragically in our world today. And I wonder with you, why do bad things happen in this world? 
You see, we don't live very long in this world before our illusions of life being filled with joy and goodness are shattered. I remember long ago seeing a little political cartoon, a little political cartoon after a man named Mark Barton walked into an Atlanta business office and shot and killed several people. In that cartoon, a little boy is sitting beside his mother and the newspaper is laying there on the table and the little boy reads the headline and it says, Atlanta murderer, Mark Barton, monster. And confused, the little boy looks up at his mother and he says, I thought you said monsters weren't real. We're all like that little boy. We ask about monsters. Why are they real in our world today? And if God is great and God is good, and God loves all of us, why doesn't God stop all the evil that is going on in this world? Well, my friends, the truth of the matter is, the Bible does not teach us that Christians will escape tragedy and turmoil in this world. Jesus said, in this world, you will have many troubles. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Our scripture lesson today is a poignant expression of a deep longing by the Hebrew children, an expression of their grief and their struggle to worship in the midst of their suffering. And yet they hold on to their belief and their trust that God hears this plaintive cry to return them to their land of Jerusalem. As we look at this question of why do bad things happen, throughout the years many people have attempted to answer this question. The scriptures are filled with this question. Not only in the Psalms, but also the entire Old Testament book of Job wrestles with this question. Jeremiah asks this question. Jeremiah says, why do the wicked prosper and the innocent suffer? The book of Lamentations is filled with this question. And the prophet Habakkuk complains, why does evil exist and the innocent suffer? Down through the years, some people have sought simplistic answers to this. Some people seeking to find an answer, say, well, you know, bad things happen because people do bad things and they deserve the punishment after all. Hmm. Have you ever heard that? Or what about when something bad happens to you, you say, dear Lord, what did I do to deserve this? I remember many years ago, my sweet, faith-filled father was a diabetic, and he lost his eyesight. He owned his own business, and he tried desperately to keep going to work. My mother worked in the office with him, as did my older sister and I. And I remember very distinctly one day Daddy got depressed over having lost his sight. And he lay down on the couch in his office when the man that we purchased coffee and snacks from came in to fill the coffee dispenser and the snack machine and got in a conversation with my dad. And the man said to my 
beautiful, loving father. Well, you know, you need to look closely in your life and determine what it is that you've done wrong so that you can confess your sin before God and be healed. The anger inside of me at that man boiled my blood over and I jumped up and I said, get out of here, get out of here right now. And he looked at me as a young 20 year old college kid, shaking his head thinking, what are you talking about? I said, get out, get out right now. You don't even know my father. How dare you presume that you know my father and how dare you think that God would punish my father like that Jesus clearly dispelled the myth that bad things happen to us because we deserve them one day Jesus was with his disciples after two specific events had happened, and he listed those events for his disciples. Pilate had executed 18 Galileans, and a tower had just collapsed and fallen on people and killed them. And Jesus asked the disciples, did this happen because of those people's sins? And Jesus responded to his disciples and said, I tell you, it did not. It did not. Bad things don't happen to us because we deserve them, my friends. And it really, really doesn't help me that there are political personalities who say they are Christians, who say dreadful things on television. Some of you will remember that after the tragic events of 9-11, a well-known religious figure went on the air and told people all over the world that God had orchestrated 9-11 to punish America for our sins. He said abortionist, feminist, gays, and lesbians had angered God. And so 9-11 was the way God chose to punish us. Do you remember that? And we wonder why people are turned against God and Christianity. My friends, we need to speak up. We need to speak up and dispel people from this belief. Why would people want to father, follow a God who punishes people, innocent people, in these ways? It's beyond me how some people can say they read these holy scriptures where Jesus takes little children upon his knee and blesses them, and then they say that God punishes little children with things like tornadoes and earthquakes and hurricanes and mass shootings in schools. So why do these things happen if it's not God's punishment and it's not a lack of faith? Well, there's a partial answer. It's called free will. God wants us to love God because we want to love God. God wants us to love others because we choose to love others. So God has given to us the gift of free will. It's a great gift. We can choose to do good with our time and our talent and our resources, our energy, our thoughts, our words, our deeds. But there's a negative side to it. People can also use their free will to do things that cause pain and suffering. 
So on 9-11, certain people chose to use their free will to get into airplanes and to crash into buildings and to kill innocent people. However, free will is only a partial answer because it doesn't address things like natural disasters, the hurricanes, the floods, the earthquakes that take place, the things that no human being causes like cancer that infects. that we will never get a full and complete answer to this question on this side of heaven Mother Teresa once said when I die God will have a lot of answering to do and Billy Graham said when I go to heaven I will spend the first 100 years just asking God questions Until that day, great day comes, we still have to learn how to live with suffering and difficulty and tragedy and deal with unfair circumstances in this world to figure out how to live. And so the first thing I want to say to you is that it's okay to ask the question why. It is okay to ask the question, why? It's not a lack of faith. It's actually a sign of faith to ask the question, why? We all experience tra tragedy and pain and difficulty in this world, and that question is natural to come to us. Dr. James Cone, a powerful preacher, said this he said to question and to wonder is to love God with one's mind to think through this question that in theological terms is called theodicy how do we hold together our belief in an all-powerful God who is all good and all loving how do we hold those two things together. It is okay to ask the question why. And it is also okay to be angry at God. Did you hear me? If you read the Psalms, you will hear the psalmist crying out in anger. Why, oh why, God, is this happening to me? Crying out in anger is also a sign of our intimate and personal relationship with God. Because let me ask you this question when you think about it. Isn't it true that the people you love the most are the ones you get the maddest at? You don't really have to answer that question out loud if you're sitting by the people you love the most. <laughs> it's an intimate and personal relationship and God can take our anger, our expression of it, to let it out instead of allowing that bitterness and anger to eat us up inside when we experience tragedy and loss, 
questioning and anger are natural. But the trick is to not get stuck in that. Remember that beautiful psalm that most of us have memorized, Psalm 23? Some think that the most beloved part of that is the phrase that says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And the beautiful part of that to me is the word walk. We walk through it. We walk through the difficult times. We keep going through the difficult times, knowing that a better day is promised in the future knowing that there is hope at the end. For the other thing that I have realized over time is that even if I get answers to why, the answers don't bring healing to my soul. Only God will bring healing to my soul. Only God will bring healing to my soul. I have walked with so many people through my ministry who have been on their deathbed or who have received a diagnosis of a terminal illness or who have lost a child to death who look at me and tell me that God has given them a peace in the midst of it. A peace in the midst of it. And I wonder how. I believe it's because they were honest with God about their feelings and they laid those emotions of anger and frustrations and questions before God. And somehow God was able to reach out to them and touch their hearts with that peace that passes understanding and bring peace to their souls. There was a dear couple in a church that I served many years ago who had a little grandchild who was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and he only lived to be a toddler before he passed away and his parents wanted to do something to bring meaning to his suffering while they couldn't get an answer to the question why they wanted his suffering to mean something. So they started up a nonprofit to help and to provide funding for other parents who were going through that same journey. Think with me about how many organizations have started because other people were touched by tragedy and they wanted to bring meaning out of that tragedy. How did they do that? They realized that the word crisis in Chinese has two characters and one represents danger and one represents opportunity. They realized that Jesus took the ugliness of a cross that meant execution and persecution and redeemed it and brought new life and resurrection and meaning from it. When I look at the cross, I think of Easter and I think of resurrection and I think of new life that is given to me because of Jesus. Bringing new meaning out of the difficulty that we've had in life. Rabbi Harold Kushner, many of you know his name. He lost his son at age 14 to a rare and horrible disease, but he rejected the idea that God was somehow responsible or even that there was a rational explanation for his suffering. And so he explained, let me suggest that bad things that happen to us in our lives do not have a meaning when they happen to us, but we can redeem those tragedies from senselessness by imposing meaning upon them. And after struggling for years with the why, Rabbi Kushner took his pain, 
and he imposed meaning on it by writing a little book entitled When Bad Things Happen to Good People. That book has helped millions of people through the years. So maybe a better question for us to ask than asking why do bad things happen to good people is to simply ask, what do good people do when bad things happen to them? What do we do with the bad things that, that happen in this world to redeem them? H.G. Spafford sought to redeem the bad that happened in his life. In 1873, his wife and four children sailed from New York to France on an ocean liner. And Mr. Spafford was unable to make the voyage with his family. He had work to attend to in Chicago. So he told them goodbye at the port, promising to meet them in France in a few weeks. At 2 o'clock one morning, on November the 22nd, 1873, when the luxury liner was several days out with his wife and children, it was hit by another ocean liner. Within two hours, the ship sank. Nine days later, when the survivors landed in Cardiff, Wales, Mrs. Spafford sent to her husband a telegram with these two words, saved alone. When he received her message, he quickly boarded passage on a ship to Europe to join his wife. And on the way over, the captain called him into his cabin and he said, I believe just now we are passing over the place where your family's vessel sank. That night, in the mid-Atlantic, filled with much pain and sorrow, Mr. Spafford wrote five stanzas. The first line of which reads, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. My friends, we're going to sing those familiar words for they are part of a popular hymn Little did Spafford know when he wrote those words that they would give comfort to so many people who go through tragedy and sorrow today. He turned his pain into something that can be meaningful and bring comfort and peace to so many of us when we deal with tragedies in our life. I wish I could say why bad things happen. I wish there was a way to stop bad things from happening on this side of heaven, but we don't know. But what we can say is that God can bring us healing in the midst. Our good shepherd is watching over us, and it can be well with our soul. Amen and amen.
And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. My friends, may it be well with your soul as you go out into the world today, trusting and believing that you do not walk alone that the Good Shepherd will help you walk through whatever difficulties this world brings to us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.